Game Breakfast. I'm live here at PAX Unplugged 2017. Now I'm really excited, not because I'm here, although it is fun to be here, but I'm also excited because the cruise is like in a week and a half. I'm also excited because if you notice, Board Game Breakfast is a little bit late this week. It's on Tuesday rather than Monday. If you're watching this, stop everything. Stop the video, pause the video, and go register for Dice Tower Con. Registration goes live today at noon Eastern Standard Time. Um, go to DiceTowerCon.com. Guys, the cruise is amazing. So is Dice Tower Con. They're both amazing, and you need to go to them. It is the best convention of the year. Go back and watch our videos. It's going to be so much better this year. We have so many fun things planned. You, just go register. I don't know when it's going to sell out, but I can guarantee you it is going to sell out. We're also getting ready for the cruise and stuff, and there's a lot of things coming. I'll do a live Q&A a little bit later today, so keep an eye out for when that's happening. Let's get to the show. In the news this week, first of all, Yellow is going to soon be releasing Decrypto. Now, I had a chance to play Decrypto at the Gathering of Friends this year, and it is one of the best deduction party games I've ever played. There's four words. You're trying to get your teammates to guess those words uh, to get like a sort of a clue without the other team figuring out from what you're saying. So it's very like giving obscure, weird clues. It's kind of a cool variation, almost like code names, but it has a very different feel. Um, Passport, you can see their booth behind me. They just announced that they're going exclusive with GTS Distribution. Now, I'm not a huge fan of this exclusivity. We've seen Asmodee went exclusive with Alliance, you know, and several years ago, lots of companies were going exclusive, then we saw them pull back. Well, now they're going again. Passport originally was with GTS Distribution. They were like a publishing arm, so this makes sense, obviously. And it's, it's a good deal for a publisher to do this because they can get a lot of you know, it gives you a kind of a focus and everything. So we'll have to wait and see how things like that turn up. Uh, Upper Deck has announced Marvel Legendary Champions. Now, this one's based on the comic book, which is good because the last one, Marger, Marvel um, Spider-Man Homecoming, was not that fantastic. I, I did not think because it was based on the movie. It's good to see them back in the comic universe. I swear. That's why I do it mostly in a studio. Uh, let's see here. Uh, WizKids has announced a uh, partnership with Wizards of the Coast. Uh, <coughs> Magic the Gathering. They're going to be doing miniatures for Magic the Gathering and um, uh, some board games and stuff with that. So that will be interesting to see as time goes by. Um, Rather Dashing has announced Wakening Lair. This is a co-op dungeon delving game. That's pretty much all I know, but Rather Dashing puts out nice light games. Uh, we have seen Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Carlton House in Queen's Pack, another Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective game. <sighs> I swear, it's a comedy show in here. In other news, the Dice Tower is just me again. Everyone else is off. Um, so there's that coming. And then uh, Games Workshop, Necromunda Underhive, which we may or may not have in our possession. Uh, the re-release of that is here. The biggest news of the week, though, is Rob Davieu and um, Wizards of the Coast have announced Betrayal Legacy. This is based on Betrayal at House on the Hill. It's a legacy game. It's coming out late next year, probably S in 2018. And it's going to be a 13-chapter go-through Betrayal at House on the Hill. Different things. They affect the future. You're like, one generation goes to the house, then another generation. Sounds amazing. I saw them playtesting it, turned away before I saw anything incriminating. Rob has done a great job, obviously, with both the Pandemic Legacies. Betrayal's an interesting game. There's a, I, I really have a lot of fun with it. Not totally balanced, but uh, it's still cool, and I think I, I like to see his take on this. So that's very exciting. All right, let's get to the Kickstarter news where there will be fewer people in the background. From monsters to mountains, we've got minis and 3D components galore today. So let's take a look at what's happening in our crowdfunding world today. 
In Monster Slaughter, coming from Ankama Games, the same group who were behind Crossmaster Arena, you play as the head of a monster family competing over a cabin full of teenagers. This tongue-in-cheek miniatures board game uses the box as the cabin where you play werewolves, vampires, golems, or zombies, each of which has their own abilities to scare and slaughter those pesky humans. The game is chock full of minis representing the teens, monsters, and other game characters. As monsters explore the cabin, opponents can play cards to help the teens in order to slow the competing families, and gameplay is designed to be streamlined, quick, and light with dice and card-based mechanisms. You can get a copy of Monster Slaughter with all the unlocked stretch goals for a pledge of 70 euros plus shipping. Dragon Canyon is a skirmish game in which players have the same heroes to leverage, but with secret selection and placement. There's also an element of bluffing and even a bit of memory. Taking place in a fantastical world full of sky riders, dino knights, and tricksters, players will use their heroes to hunt and scavenge, raid caravans, and more. You'll be able to use tile abilities as well and summon dragons and build monuments. Originally published in Asia, Sweet Lemon Publishing is bringing this super fast and colorful game to English-speaking markets, and it even features a new solo mode. You can get a copy of Dragon Canyon for a pledge of €25 Euro plus shipping. D-Day Dice is a cooperative game set on that infamous day of World War II, and Word Forge Games is kickstarting the second edition of this game. In D-Day Dice, allied soldiers are making an attack run against a machine gun nest. You start with just a few soldiers, and you'll be rolling dice to collect resources and weaponry and deal with the results of battle in the hopes of advancing up that beach. There's also an expansion available, War Stories, that includes new battle maps, more units, and a fifth player component set. A number of additional battle maps and other extended content has been unlocked through stretch goals for the base game and expansion, and you can get the base for £35 or the base and expansion for £60 plus shipping. Big Kids Games is bringing Rudiger Dorn's Montana to North America, Australia, and New Zealand. Released at Essen this year, Montana has players building settlements by collecting goods, excavating mines, and managing other resources. The game uses a spinner to recruit workers, which is an uncommon component in Euro-style games. But don't worry, there are built-in mechanisms to mitigate the luck of the spin. You use workers to gain resources, to then use to place settlements, and there are also benefits for building settlements in a line. Montana is a great, quick, lightweight worker placement game, and through this campaign, you'll be getting an upgraded version that includes screen-printed wooden bits for a pledge of $49 plus shipping. Boardcubator is kickstarting Space Race Intercosmos. Space Race is a card-based engine-building game full of combos, bidding, and resource management set in the world of the early Space Race as countries compete to build the most advanced space exploration program. Through seven rounds, you acquire new cards and activate your other card abilities through simultaneous action selection that has tough restrictions. Cards feature a lot of info and great-looking stylish art. The Intercosmos expansion adds China for a fifth player, new universe cards that advance the technology options and scenarios, and the new achievements give players objectives to work towards adding a set collection element to your gameplay. To get just the Intercosmos expansion, you'll need to pledge 19 euro, but to get the base game and expansion, that takes a pledge of 54 euro plus shipping. And finally, Mountaineers 3D is an eye-catching game featuring a modular centerpiece mountain board that spins. Mountaineers 3D is a game of area control, resource management, and pathing. Players get unique character cards with different abilities, and you win by gaining climbing points using route cards, handling events, and upgrading your gear. Be careful because automated climbers are on the mountain as well, and they can interfere with your climb in a few different ways, including sabotage. But there are also special actions that help you along your climb. Clearly, Mountaineers has a unique table presence, and there are a number of different pledge levels, but the Deluxe Edition adds a 5th and 6th player and more mountain boards for $75. But the base pledge for Mountaineers 3D takes a pledge of just $49 plus shipping. Alrighty, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week.
Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here, and if you are anything like me, then when given the opportunity to spend a full day playing board games, you leap into action, spending every possible moment of the day playing cards, rolling dice, and moving mountains of meeples. Time flies when you're fully immersed in the gaming experience, and before you know it, the hunger pangs in your stomach start reminding you that you played right through lunch, and it's been 13 hours since you remembered to eat anything. But stopping to eat would mean stopping the game, if only there was a board game that you could eat. Well, now there is. That's because several days ago, Catan.com, the official website for all things Catan, announced the upcoming North American release of Catan Chocolate Edition. Now what you're saying, this has got to be a gimmick. This can't possibly be an edible version of the game. Chocolate must be just referring to the color of the pieces or something. It's got to be a trick. This is no trick. This is an actual edition of Catan made of the finest Belgian chocolate. So stop contradicting me in front of my friends. But how can Catan be played with chocolate? Well, according to the publisher's website, just like in classic Catan, players still harvest and trade the resources wool, brick, lumber, grain, and ore with their opponents, and these resources are still used to build roads, settlements, and knights. Ah, but what makes Catan Chocolate Edition different is that the game pieces are 32 chocolate bars made from the finest Belgian chocolate. The game rules are also simplified. Oh, wait, wait, y you can't just tack on a statement about altering the game's core rules and expect that to go unnoticed? Simplified? In what way? Are we still playing Catan here or not? Of course! Catan Chocolate Edition is just like the classic Catan that you originally fell in love with. Except, in this version of Catan, all the resources are chocolate bars that players place on the table in front of themselves when they build buildings. And the larger their Coco Empire, the more victory points they have. Which is great, because the first player to reach five victory points wins! So you see, it's just like regular Catan, except made of chocolate. And this version is designed to be played in 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, and instead of dice, a spinner is used to determine which resources are distributed to the players. And resources used to build structures are kept in front of the players instead of being returned to the bank. And the game's end condition is different, as is the scoring. And you can eat the game when you're done. So I want to know, have your taste buds been tempted to the point where you'll be adding this version of Catan to your collection? And what game would you like to see made out of chocolate? And possibly most importantly, why would anyone think that this is a good idea? So on this week's episode, which is actually the first episode, it's going to be some of my favorite videos of all time. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Pope and this is What to Check Out, where we basically go on the internet, check out videos, articles, wherever you can find, and if I find something that's interesting, I go ahead and show it to you. So, let's go ahead and start. If you find anything that's better than these videos, be sure to definitely mention to me on Twitter or shoot me a message at OfficialLTTT and I'll go ahead and check it out. So the very first one is actually Dice Tower related. It, Tom Vassell does an apology video for his review of Vasco da Gama. So just in case you've never seen a review, I highly suggest you go ahead and check out his Vasco da Gama review. He didn't like the game at all, spoilers, but it's still definitely worth checking out. Afterwards, he then made an apology video for it, and it was hilarious. So after that one, next on the list, we have how other people treat your cards. Now this one is based off of a very overdone joke where um, people just don't treat your cards as well as you'd like them to. But this one takes it to a whole new level, and I don't want to spoil, spoil the video for it, but it surprised me I was laughing the entire time the first couple times I've seen this video. It's hilarious. And next one is Chess Clock Jenga. Now it's less about the video itself, which it is actually a very charming and cool video and everything, but what it taught me to apply to other games. Now the next one on the list is Murder, the board game. Now just be advised that this one is not as kid-friendly or family friendly as the other videos. There are a couple swears towards the very end of the video. Now it's very well produced in a very simplistic manner. It doesn't have the crazy production or animation that you'd see in some videos, but it seems like this is like the kind of style of video that could easily have been a crime comedy series. And then finally to the last video, this is by far, by a long shot, my favorite video of all time. It is Why is Hero Quest so great? But what makes Why Hero Quest is so great so great is that I've never played Hero Quest in my life and I really don't really have any plans to play it 
but the video was still hilarious regardless of all of that. There was maybe not a moment in this video that I wasn't laughing hysterically the first few times I watched it. And I've probably watched this video 20 to 30 times at this point now. Also to know the Bard, he should probably be on a TV show. He seems funny enough that honestly, I could see him on the Big Bang Theory. Just throw him as a special guest every other episode and give him absolutely no lines. I bet he will steal the show. So till next time guys, I hope you're enjoying your breakfast. What's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, the Miami Dice is back in town. We'll be doing reviews of Otis, the ticket to ride, new maps for that, and um, uh, Majesty, some really great stuff. I'll be reviewing Fjord, Pulsar 2849, and a whole pile of other games. We got interviews from Jason Levine uh, coming your way that he did a lot of interviews at PAX. Um, so just really cool stuff. People that you haven't seen on our channel being interviewed before, so that's cool. And um, we got a great show. I'm really excited about our, sh our show that we did. It includes our top 10 that we did at PAX. If we can get the video for our top 10 at PAX, that's going to go up this week. That was a lot of fun to do. So lots of great things coming out from the channel this week. Now, I do want to give you a bit of a heads up. Next week, no, wait, never mind. I'm not giving you a heads up about anything. Let's just keep going. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. All right, fine, we're just gonna say it. Leonardo da Vinci was a hack. He thinks the Vitruvian man looked like that. Psh, we're the Vitruvian man. Boom! Look familiar? It doesn't get more ideal than either of this. You know what, da Vinci is a hack because he's only looking skin deep. Psh, he's all about physical, I'm about mental. Yeah, I'm about emotional. Who's emotionally available? Thanks to Bing Bongs. And Roger. Da Vinci doesn't know anything, inventor, Painter, whatever. I paint. Yeah, the Mona Lisa was smirking because she's like, this guy's a joke. She's like, where are my eyebrows? I don't need them. Perfect man. <laughs> I don't know what a perfect man looks like. I'm looking at him now. I'm seeing double. I just want the world to finally admit that they don't care about Leonardo da Vinci. The best thing Leonardo da Vinci gave us was a Ninja Turtle. Out. So this is... Da Vinci's Challenge. It's an abstract game where you take a color, it's a two player game, and you're gonna be placing either these like oblong pieces or these triangle pieces on the board. You can place them wherever you want and you're trying to make different designs. So you can place them here or here, and you're going for all these different designs that are on this reference sheet. So you can see these are the designs that you're going for. So you're trying to not telegraph what you're going for. And you're trying to, once you complete a design, you mark it down on the sheet and you get those amount of points at the end of the game. You go until everyone runs out of pieces and whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. That was Da Vinci's challenge. If I eventually was sculpting me, I'd have him sculpting me like this. I just feel like this is a very artistic, powerful hand. So what do you think of this game, man? Kind of abstract. I mean, as for an abstract little game, it's it's good. It's very very simple. You're just taking one of your tiles and then you're just, you're just placing it. That's yeah. it. I like the fact that you can create so many different designs and score multiple at a time. It was actually very hard for me to like visualize. I probably miss out on a lot of points. My main complaint with the game is I just feel like it's too long. I like them like Santorini or Onitama. I like where they're. Sh high strategy but they're short so we can just bang out a few yeah, of them. Yeah, you can do like a best of three. Yeah, I would rather do that than have like one longer abstract game. Over on YouTube on our own channel, The Brothers Murph, we did our Brothers Murph top 10 games of all time last Ooh. week. So please check that out. So until next time, we'll see you in an oil painting. We'll see you there. Maybe a sculpture perhaps. I'll, I'll go back to my hand. Probably uh, hearing a lot about PAX Unplugged at this week, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about it. I didn't know much about PAX this year. I went to PAX East in Boston and wanted to check it out, and that's mostly video games, but they had a huge board game section. And so they decided to start their own tabletop convention, PAX Unplugged, and they announced it at Philadelphia. So we wanted to come see it because I was curious to see this new big convention, and it is a big convention. We're talking, it's bigger than Origins, folks. There is a ton of people here, and it's a new audience. There's a lot of young people. I'm one of the older people here, which is kind of cool. 
um, and everyone is here to play games. So you can see behind me here, this is like the open gaming area that they have here. Now, there's not a lot of people in here right now because the halls aren't open, but when the halls open, this area is packed um, over here. And this was the area that I was in earlier um, when you saw me talking about what's coming up. This area here is where they have hot games and you can see they got Ganges, they got the new Ticket to Ride maps, they got Majesty, and the, all the hot games from Essen are there. So you can go play those games, or they sit up on the tables. Over here on this side, you can just see how there's a, a huge publishing area. Not, I mean, that's not, it's not as big as Gen Con, not as big as Essen, but it's bigger than most other conventions. And there's so many publishers. All the main publishers are here selling their games and, and products. And we have a booth, we're sharing a booth with Geek and Son in there. And it's just fantastic. The people here are not in a hurry. This is like the main focus of this con. The people are here to play games. You know, they, they stand in line, they watch different panels. Um, they, they go around, they demo games. They're not buying a lot of games, but they're mostly just wanting to play games. I can't tell you how much fun that is for me to just go around and see people all over the place playing games, to jump into people playing games, uh, uh, to teach people. Everyone is here just to learn and have a good time. No one's in a rush. There's not huge lines to buy the latest and hottest games. They're just wanting to play games, and I love that. This convention has great signage. The, the volunteer staff is good. If you swing around here again and you look, you'll see even the people in the purple shirts back here are enforcers, um, and they right now are learning some of these games so that they can teach them to the people who come. They do a good job. If you look around, you know, the whole place is clean. It's neat. Um, it's not perfect, right? There's definitely hiccups, but I am definitely coming back next year and bringing a whole Dice Tower team. This has been one of my favorite cons of the year for sure. Um, it's the biggest opening of a con I've ever seen. I mean, this is year one, and it looks like a con that's been around for 10 or so many years. Next year, it's going to be a little bit later in the year, um, in December, I believe, so... That's a little less stressful, you know, this is the week before Thanksgiving, and next week is, the, uh, you know, the Thanksgiving itself, but that will still be pretty cool. Um, I'm, I'm just excited. So if you live anywhere in the area, this is great. Uh, you talk to people here, the, the food the food around, you can do, like walk out of the convention, get food, walk right back in like five minutes. You, the people here are very friendly. Um, it's, ah, it's just, it's about playing games. On the Dice Tower itself, we are often pushing games, right? That, that's our thing. We review games. We say, this game's great, get it. This game is not good. But the motto of the Dice Tower has always been, we talk about games, but especially the people who play them. And this con really embodies that. It's especially the people who play them. Sure, there's games here. They're pushing you know, games at all the different booths, but it's about the people who play them. There's, there's a section here where they are just teaching people to play games. Like Rodney Smith from Watch It Played got up and taught like 50 people at the same time how to play a game. That's really cool. And they brought in all the media and all kinds of people. It's just exciting. And I think we're only going to see this con get bigger and bigger till I think at some point this con could even rival Gen Con. Now, I might be wrong on that. If it stays this size forever, totally fine with that. But I am leaving this convention refreshed, invigorated, excited about playing games. This is the final day of the con when I'm recording this, and I'm feeling pretty good, which is a great way to go through things. Very, very happy. So thanks for watching, and if you have a chance, come to PAX Unplugged. Hello and welcome to the best and the worst. And today we are talking about Reef Route from Brain Games. My name is Niels, Sybil's Brettspiele, and let's take a look what my favorite part is. My favorite part of Reef Route is very easy. It's super easy. My little girl loves to play it and bring it on the, onto the table again and again and again. Wow, that is mind-blowing. I love to play with my little girl. I love when she's picking a game. I also like when it's always the same game, honestly, that's great. If I can play with my little girl a game, great. By the way, she's five. Um, but on the other hand, 
this game is really not fun at all for adults. The only thing you are doing is rolling this. If you're having a predator, great. Put that one ahead or up or down on your turn. And the red one, if you are the red player, you can go up and down as well. If it's not your color, you have to go one forward. And last man standing, the last color is winning. Or the first player who's crossing the finish line. This is his chain here. Um, but, <laughs> I mean, honestly, this is just roll your dice and have luck or no luck. So it's not a uh, fantastic game, but the best part is my little girl brings it onto the table again and again. And that is phenomenal. That was my favorite part of Reef Route and the thing I don't like too much on it. See you next time here on the Board for Game Breakfast. Bye bye, Niels. Hi everyone. Last weekend I was invited to the biggest board game fair that the Netherlands has. It is called Spellenspectakel. It is held in the city of Eindhoven and I was in luck because the Lights Festival Glow was also held in the same city and I got to take a peek at those beautiful creations on my way back. But the fair itself was great fun. I was there with my son so I played a lot of kids games but the main reason I got there was to take a look at which game won the Dutch Board Game Award, the Nederlandse Spellenprijs. Nominated were King Domino, Imhotep and Dream Home. This week I am playing a game that has won the Dutch Spellenprijs 2017. This week I am playing Droomhuis. Droomhuis or Dream Home like it is called in English is a game in which players are competing who makes the best house. You do this by every round drafting one room for your house. The rules are very intuitive and I've played this with kids, I've played this with people who are not into board games at all and they immediately got the idea of the game. You can only build a room if there's an, a room beneath it supporting it. So you can't start building on the top floor of your house. Every card depicts how many points it scores. Like having a small living room just might give you one point but if you add some tiles to it then you get a bigger living room to get more points. But that might maybe means that you don't have have room for a bathroom or a kitchen. In the end you score points if your roof is all in one color and you might get some bonus points. But you also get points if your house has the basic things like a kitchen, a bathroom and a living room. In my opinion Dream Home is a perfect winner for the Nederlandse Spellenprijs and I highly recommend it to wherever country you are from. Dream Home. Thanks for watching. My name is Dave Luza. Bye. Hey gang, and welcome to the Tantrum House HQ. I'm Will Meadows. And I'm Ryan Pills. And today on The Throwdown, we've got Werewords in the red corner. And Spyfall in the blue corner. Spyfall from Cryptozoic is a group party game where one player acts as the spy trying to figure out where everyone else is hanging out. At the beginning of the game, all the players are dealt a location card that shows the same location on it, all except the spy that is. Then players take turns asking simple questions that relate to the location. The players are trying to catch the spy in a lie because he won't know the correct answer. But they are trying not to be too obvious with their questions because if they give away too much information, the spy will figure out where they are located and he'll win. Werewords from Bezier Games is a secret identity party game in which players are trying to guess a secret word. Players randomly select the, their secret identity and then they will either try to help the team guess the secret word or if they are part of the werewolves team they will try to lead the townspeople astray. Once the timer starts, players ask the mayor in 20 questions style phrases questions trying to narrow down the answer. If time runs out before the townspeople have guessed the werewolves win, but the townsfolk have a chance to snatch victory away if they can correctly identify the werewolf. Alright, so we're looking at two different secret identity party games. Are you ready for the throwdown? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Three, Three two, two, one. one. Throwdown. I'll go Spyfall. I was a little torn, actually. I enjoy this game a lot. It has a lot of cool art. There are some tiny pitfalls that people have identified. Like, if you are the spy, it's really hard not to stare at the board. And when you do stare at the board, it's obvious who you are. So it's yeah, a little tough. That, that's me. I'm always very obvious. <laughs> Why'd you fix Werewords? I liked Werewords because of the werewolf mechanic could be anybody it could even be the, the mayor. mayor and that just throws people off so much i just i love that about it and it's just a very simple game to get into because it's it's 20 questions but with a secret it's identity cool mechanic stuff. yeah lots of fun thank you guys for watching the show be sure to subscribe to our tantrum house youtube channel and we'll see you next time
Hi, Mike Delicio from Solo Mode Games. Today I want to take a few moments to talk to you about a board game publisher that has kind of come out of nowhere to me. Over the last year or so, the publisher Board and Dice have come out with three games that I've become acquainted to primarily because they have a solitaire mode. They also all play multiplayer. The first game that I came across was called Multi Universum. It's a small card game with a space theme. The cards are really uh, based on action selection. Depending on where they are in a card array, you can take different actions to do different things. Sets up quickly, tears down quickly, a clever game. The second game that I came across is one that I've been very, very impressed with, and it's called Pocket Mars. This is a game with a space colonization theme, multi-use cards, hand management with a really clever card cycling mechanic. I've played this one quite a bit and I've really, really enjoyed it. This is one that I've also played multiplayer and enjoyed quite a bit too. Most recently, I got a hold of a game of theirs called Super Hot. This is based off of a video game. I'm not terribly familiar with the game. I really like the art aesthetic. It's being billed as a micro deck builder, and from what I've seen of that, I've really uh, been enjoying that. This is uh, a game that I think is going to reward multiple plays because there's some interesting mechanics on how the cards cycle. So the thing that these games all have in common is that they are small card games and a small box that play as more than a filler. They also all have a solitaire mode, so obviously that's going to get my uh, attention. And also, ironically, none of them have a board and none of them have dice. So maybe uh, someone from the company can, uh, if they see this, explain uh, their company name. But otherwise, I'd be interested to know if you've played any of these games and if so, what your thoughts are. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day. Hello! My name's Dan, this is Cora, and we're here today to talk to you about kids' games for children around five and under. But sometimes we're straying a little bit above that these days, because you're, you're very clever, aren't you? <laughs> and you're getting older, so we, we, we're straying into the older market. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about this game. What is it, Cora? Hippo. Hippo. Oh, yeah. I've only got three to get rid of. Hippos is a dice rolling maths game where players are throwing life rings into a swimming pool. On their turn a player rolls three dice and uses the results of them, adding them up in any combination, to throw a ring into a particular section of the pool. Each section can only take a limited number of rings, and if your roll would take that section over that number, then another ring gets pushed back out, preferably one of your opponents. The first person to have all 12 of their rings in the water is the winner. So Cora, what do you think about Hippo? I like it. Why do you like it? Because I win all the time. Because you win all the time? <laughs> you do, you do. It's a very, it's a maths game, isn't it? Yeah. It's a maths game and, and you like your maths. <laughs> yeah. And there's lots of adding and, and, and making, trying and to work. I keep finding out ways to get the better numbers. You do. I? And I tried adding up the numbers in different, in all sorts of ways in every way. Then I just saw it was then. I put them up to the thing, which I was actually going to do when I planned it out, and then done it before I just made a mistake by doing it straight away. Yeah, you, you, you thought about what you were doing before you did it. Yeah. And that's a really good skill. I like it too. I also like the graphic design of this game, and a lot of the games uh, by, by this publisher, Helvatique, I think they're very elegant, very stylish. I think it's really nice, I mean, and it'd be a great gift for somebody as well. So, we give this game to Hippos in the Swimming Pool, Thumbs up! Splash, 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 splash! Well, hi there! I'm back, baby! How you been? How's life? How's stuff? Are you good? Yeah, g great. Where was I? It's, uh, no, no one cares. Uh, what was I doing? Mysteries, and why was I there? Secrets. I was on holiday, basically, seeing friends. It was good, but while I was away, I was away from not only you guys and, you know, real reality, but also away from all my games. I love you. Not you, Yido. You're mean. But while I was away, I had a little bit of an epiphany because I got a few messages, two or three, of people I don't know, people who I'd never met, who asked me, hey, you're in the area, do you fancy playing a board game? And you know what? That's really cool. Now, while that never actually worked out, 
I normally move state from depressed just to like a low numb. Or geographically as well. And it dawned on me that, you know, board games are more than just a hobby. It's a whole community. And that is pretty cool. So, you know, yay games. Not you, Yido. <laughs> Yido. All right, side note, I'm doing a podcast. Ping, I guess. It's called This Game Is Broken, and it includes various voices that correspond to faces that you may recognize. So again, ping. I guess I'll, you know, see you next week. All right, well. That's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks to all the contributors. They always do a fantastic job. I had a chance to meet and hang out with a lot of them here, and so that's an exciting thing. Uh, thanks to all of those of you who came to PAX Unplugged and said hi to me, and I really appreciate that. Very nice of you. And a couple more things. There's a little pin that we have at PAX Unplugged that we gave out. Those pins, they're not available yet on Cool Stuff, but keep an eye. We're going to have them available soon enough. You can find many of our promos that we had in our Indiegogo campaign this year are now on Cool Stuff, for, so if you want to support Dice Tower that way you can get them. But the most important thing to take away from this, Dice Tower Con registration. Noon, today. Do it. Sign up. Don't miss out on it. I'll see you guys next time. Until now, until then. I don't know. I'm all flustered, but I'm having a fantastic time. I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower.